Today on Great Places Seen, we head to a trail of surveillance from below and above as we cross bridges to survey the past and deep past of this serene Maryland mountain retreat fit for a president and the rest of us as we take flight to this sweet oasis. Keep your eagle eye out for what's cooking here. The area around my home in Washington, D.C. is filled with great weekend getaways that offer choices from complete downtime to explorations of this unique region. Today I'm heading a short distance north, past Frederick to Cunningham Falls State Park, when I'm between a couple of longer trips, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania are all fairly easy day trips, with many convenient state parks, each with their own distinct attractions. I've been here before but not for a long time. Hmm, I guess it's been almost 30 years? <laughs> yes, a long time. I'm looking forward to getting reacquainted with Cunningham Falls. It's not a large park, so it can fill up as a result, but it makes for a convenient destination, and there's more here than most people realize beyond its main feature, a waterfall. There are two main campground areas, one next to US Route 15, and the other where I'm staying, up Catoctin Mountain by a lake and the waterfall. Well, here's my campsite for the evening, electric only. I've carried water with me, so that's not an issue. And well, look down there. There are the bathrooms in the bathhouse, so I'm all set. I tell you, I've seen more signs in these parks for bears than actual bears. And not just bears. Nice, clean amenities, what I routinely see in Maryland State Parks. One minor issue here is that the plug on the pedestal is upside down, so my surge protector can't hang as it normally does. And otherwise, uh, upside down, it, it tends to fall out. So, had to be a little creative and just uh, loop the electric cable over to to help hold it in place because otherwise it was just falling out of the socket and well that's no good it's very fortunate with this site extremely level i basically just drop the trailer chalk the wheels and unhitch it's another hot summer day in dc but here on the mountain Pleasant and cool with a delightful breeze through the trailer. As tempting as it is to sit here for a while, I'm only here overnight, so off to the trail. Yeah, this one's shorter, but it looks more difficult. I have two choices to reach the falls, and I'm in no mood to go rock climbing on the cliff trail. So it's around the ridge on the much smoother main trail, actually the shorter of the two routes. At least coming back, it's downhill. I'm already losing light on this side of the mountain. My camera doesn't seem to be too thrilled. It looks a bit jittery. It almost looks like a petrified squirrel. It's a gall, an outgrowth caused by insects or a virus. This has to be one of the coolest ones I've ever seen. At first, I thought it was a real squirrel. Several side trails lead to views of steep drop-offs. And the rocks. I love lots of rocks. These have a camouflage feel with patches of lichen and moss dotting their surface. The 
The light is improving as I work around more to the western side of the ridge. I mean, this is quite unique geology here. They say this mountain is 500 million years old and that the Catoctin Mountains were once similar in size and shape to the Himalayas. Can you imagine that? Peaks 25,000 feet tall here? That is amazing. Right now, the elevation is about 2,100 feet, 2,145, something like that. A little bit shorter than the Himalayas, or Himalayas, as some people say. All the rocks here are just so colorful. So over millions of years, this has eroded down to a tenth of the size that it once was. It looks like this tree, when it fell, uprooted a rock. Here it is, Cunningham Falls. Like many waterfalls at this time of year, the water flow isn't at its peak. Early spring snowmelt and rain transform this into a raging torrent, cascading down the huge stone steps until it pools and swirls at the bottom before continuing its run down the mountainside. At its peak, I wouldn't be able to stand here on the lower rocks. This is the largest cascading waterfall in Maryland, with a 78-foot or 24-meter drop. It's locally known as McAfee Falls, named after a family of early settlers. There's evidence of an old homestead above the falls. Cunningham Falls is apparently named after a photographer from nearby Penmar Park, who frequently set his camera here. The park is one of several protected areas occupying 50-mile-long Catoctin Mountain. Literally behind me on the ridge is Camp David. Now I'm sure they can hear me. <laughs> so they are getting audio from this before you are. It's been cleared. Adapted from the federal employee retreat known as High Catoctin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt established the residence as USS Shangri-La. President Eisenhower renamed it Camp David in honor of his grandson. It's an ideal place for presidents to relax, work, and host foreign leaders. While I'm here, President Biden is at Camp David. I've dropped down to 43-acre man-made Hunting Creek Lake. No presidential helicopter. What's flying here are barn swallows. These little guys are fast and busy feeding young ones in nests tucked under the roof of an outbuilding. Let's try to slow them down a little.
There's a large picnic area along the shore. A big recreation hall that resembles an old barn. There's even a solar power algae control unit. I looked it up. A mere $72,000 floating out there. Two beaches on opposite sides spread out enjoyment when it's warm. Small boat ramps allow for light catch and release fishing on the water. Very scenic. Cell service, it's spotty, although I've spotted a cell tower. I think I've seen a fair bit for a late trip out. I'll enjoy a nice evening in. An overnight stay means I'm hitching back up. It doesn't mean I'm leaving so soon. Before I roll, I'm adding some water to my tank to use for the day. Now, a short drive down the mountain to the lower half of the park. The visitor center is closed today, but the turtles are out. Here's Rachel, a wood turtle named after conservationist Rachel Carlson. An eastern box turtle, Besley, honoring Maryland's first state forester, Fred Besley. We don't know how old they are, but both turtles have been here 16 years at this point. Box turtles, by the way, can live to be a hundred. The park also has an impressive aviary. I have to first step into disinfectant to help safeguard the birds from avian flu. These birds are no longer able to sustain themselves in the wild, but well cared for here, they live on to teach us about them. Now there's a stare from a wise old great horned owl. It's a hot day. This barn owl is remaining still, recessed in the shade. A red-tailed hawk is also tucked back on his perch. This red-shouldered hawk is, for now, out in the sun. Yeah, it's warm. And then, there's Ted, a magnificent American bald eagle. Ted appears to have just one good eye, 
but it's still a sharp eagle eye scanning everything in sight. Around the corner is a mock eagle nest. It's about three feet or a full one meter across. You could sit a small child or two in that. Ted is really special. It's rare to be that close to a full grown eagle. Next to the visitor center is a garden teeming with colorful Maryland flowers. I'm in the shade, all alone in the parking lot. I'm going down an adjacent trail, not too far. I'm following along Little Hunting Creek, which is known for native brook trout. With Camp David next door, it's no wonder several presidents have cast their lines into this creek, including Herbert Hoover, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Dwight Eisenhower. Clearly, the creek has attracted many others for decades. Continuing, I cross US Route 15. The park website says there are 46 steps up. Well, that means 46 down. Here's an old stone hearth several steps off the trail. This used to be Locust Pond. Locust Pond was largely filled in during the 1960s when US Route 15 expanded to a four-lane divided highway. Before then, locals enjoyed small rowboats and ice skated during the winter. It said President Franklin Roosevelt fished here. This is a special relic of the past. From 1872, this bowstring truss bridge once carried people in traffic over Big Pipe Creek in Detour, Maryland. Squire Whipple invented the bridge 30 years earlier. The arch, or bow, was joined to a flat deck called the string. Diagonal beams between the two maintained tension to support the structure. These bridges were shipped throughout the country, unassembled, to quickly span creeks and small rivers. Very few remain, as most were eventually scrapped or melted down for other uses. This bridge decayed over time with heavy use. In the 1970s, it was narrowed and relocated 11 miles to here for park visitors to use. Emerging from the wooded trail, another place from the past. Built around 1785, this was known as Iron Master's Mansion, or Catoctin Manor. 
It stood steps away from Catoctin Furnace, which we'll explore in a moment. This is where the furnace owner and family lived, with enslaved domestic servants running and maintaining the enormous house. Maryland was part of the South, which embraced slavery, and just a few miles away lay the Mason-Dixon line, over which was Pennsylvania, a northern state where everyone was free. This mansion had ten fireplaces, massive windows, and numerous outbuildings to support the life of its wealthy residents. The last resident moved out in 1937. Under first federal and then state ownership, the mansion was allowed to decay. Its ruins stabilized, but far from displaying the grandeur of the home and what it once represented. This is what remains of Catoctin Furnace. Thomas Johnson was a lawyer, and later the first governor of Maryland. His brothers, Roger, Baker, and James, built Catoctin Furnace beginning in 1775. The furnace was up and running in time to provide ammunition to General George Washington and his army in 1780. A large portion of almost a thousand 10-inch iron bombshells weighing over 31 tons made here were used in Virginia to fight the British at Yorktown. An old sign, by the way, says a hundred tons. Regardless, that decisive battle secured freedom for the new country. Most of the early workers producing those shells were not free. An estimated 271 enslaved people of African descent were among them. It wasn't until the middle of the 19th century when their labor would be replaced by European immigrants. The area seems pastoral and pleasant now. It was anything but while the furnace was operating. Temperatures inside were upwards of 120 degrees. Smoke, ash, and smells similar to rotten eggs permeated the air. The mountain was bare. An acre of trees were slashed every day to make charcoal as fuel for the furnace. Huge pits mined for ore dotted the land. Catoctin Furnace was pivotal during the U.S. Civil War. Union General John Reynolds marched his troops through here toward Gettysburg. The furnace continued, shall we say, full blast, uninterrupted during the war. Daily, three tons of pig iron were shipped east for larger arsenals and forges to make war materials. Iron from Catoctin Furnace made protective plates for the USS Monitor ironclad ship. Lost and disoriented soldiers leaving Gettysburg were offered jobs because of a chronic labor shortage. The original casting barn was torn down and decades later rebuilt for the 1976 bicentennial. Coal replaced charcoal from trees in 1873 Iron from Catoctin Furnace went into car wheels, stoves, tools, and utensils until it finally closed in February 1903. Back over the bridge, back into the present, and time to roll my wheels. Thanks for watching, and follow GPS to the next destination. <laughs> <laughs>